as a tournament, I thought it was uh, typical of tournaments in Holland, really well run, that side of it. From the hockey perspective, I thought clearly there were some teams that were more, much stood out much more than others, uh, so not in any particular order, but uh, if I say Australia, uh, Rude played really well. Uh, Germany, I thought, played well, but they played a bad game against uh, Argentina. Um, uh, the next game they had to come out and play against New Zealand, who were very dangerous and could be very dangerous. Colin Batch is a pretty smart sort of coach, knows what's happening. And uh, Germany uh, took them to the cleaners, so I think that sort of indicated to me, uh, from what I saw in the, the Argentina game, uh, that was uh, more of an aberration than that being their normal standard. Uh, uh, the Dutch, uh, I thought they were, they were pretty good. Um, their midfield and front plays were very good. Their weakness was going to be in their defence, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, and Argentina actually were someone who, uh, a team that's come, on, uh, come along a bit. They've got quite useful players all over the hockey field. They uh, are quite clever under pressure, uh, able to get the ball out under pressure and change their system. They're, it was almost like watching a, a soccer team where in Australia we tend to not talk about systems so much or uh, if you change a player going from 4-3-3 to 4-4-2 or whatever in, in or uh, or four three two one in in uh, soccer that's very uh, normal and Argentina at different stages were looking at if I use soccer terminologies four three and three but all of a sudden you see them go to four four and a two and it seemed to me that they were quite clever at, at, at getting whenever the, an opposition team went to a, a back three. So, for example, Australia was quite good at going from a four to a three, so were Germany, so uh, New Zealand, but Argentina quite, were quite quick to recognise all that and could just drop a player, and so they had all that set up. So I was quite impressed with them. Uh, I think after that there were some teams that disappointed. So, overall impressions, yeah, top teams, really good, and I think there's even, for me, I think there's a bit more of a gap. I think it was very clear early on after the first week. Uh, who was going to be the top three or four teams? That sort of stood out for me. If I go, if I have a look at them uh, in order, in a bit more uh, uh, in depth now. So let's have a look at the Dutch first. The Dutch players. Okay. The Dutch. Uh, interesting because I'm familiar with some of the Dutch players and the systems they play. There's a huge argument going on in Holland at the moment, and has been for two years about where they play their centre forward, Billy Bakker because he presents a problem to them. If he plays in the midfield, all of a sudden they've got him, uh, they've got Kemperman, they've got, uh, uh, forget his name, midfield, I'll think of it in a minute, uh, uh, who, they would have four really good midfielders. At the moment they've got three, and if one's off the field, that leaves them with two. So they don't quite have the depth and the structure that they need. Backer back to the midfield might make a, a difference because he's not a centre forward. But the bigger problem they had, the Dutch, is the bringing the ball out of the back. So they basically played a four, a three, and a three. They basically played out to the sides. They basically go down one side, and uh, a couple of clever players like Vega, and if you had Backer in the middle, are very good at coming inside at the right moments. Very similar to if you, if you have a look at the last goal that Australia scored in the, in the World Cup, the second last goal, where Jamie Dwyer had the ball out on the left, and quite often they go down the side. This time Jamie goes, oh, no, I'm not doing that. So in he goes, runs inside, straight at the goal. In the final, that's also how Holland scored their first goal, and they never did it again for the rest of, the tournament, for the rest of that game, where they went out to the left, brought it back inside, hit an angle ball to Backer, who went off to Hertzberger, who runs inside and hits a reverse hit. So Holland, basically a four, a three, and a three, very good at changing from, from a four to a three. Similar to Australia, they either did it by running a, can I draw on this jump? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I said, draw your board. So if they start with a four, so they're going this way, they either ran one of their players, the outside defender right up the ground and just left these three, at the back, so with that player up, they would generally, because of the player they played here at the start, was a guy called DeWine, who is a very, very good hockey player. But the, but the moment that DeWine wasn't on the field, 
So, so he's the left defender. So when he was out there and he was an attacker, he could easily play in the midfield to wide, he's that good. But with the modern hockey and the changing of uh, players, the moment he's not on the field, a young fellow called Balkerstein played there. And he can't bring the ball out. He's an extremely dogged defender, but can't bring the ball out. Here we have, uh, so I'll just, I'll talk about some of their other players in a minute. So structure wise, they could always attack changing a four into a three using their left hand sided player to wine, the same as we uh, Australia do, both left and right. But when DeWine's not on there, they can't do it. So that changes, the, they're limited then straight away in their structure just by people they've got on the hockey field. Uh, the other thing that they did, the, the Dutch, was uh, generally speaking, after being a four or going to a three, was if they were at a three and their midfielder was out here and then their front players were in here, is then play to those spaces out, out wide. Uh, the times that they didn't do that, they were very, very dangerous, and that was when players like, especially, uh, Vega and Kemperman. So we've got the, the hockey field here. Kemperman was generally on the left, sometimes on the right. Vega the same, sometimes on the... He's Argentinian, by the way, for those that don't know. Um, but when, instead of doing those passes, when they decided to actually run infield and go at the back defender of any of the opposition, was when they had uh, gave teams problems, especially teams who played their sweeper high. Because the moment they pulled inside, then all the other defenders are left one out with a player as soon as you come into a high sweeper. So they were just passing the ball then to, to one-on-ones. And the Dutch, like most top teams, Dutch, Germans, Australians, when you play two one-on-ones, we know how to uh, beat people. So I'll just go back and, uh, and reiterate, though, the, for those that want to go look on tapes and have a look how Backer played the, they call it the Spitz in Holland, but centre forward. And he, he's the sort of kid who's grown up, he's played his whole life in that part of the hockey field as a midfielder. And I know that because from a very young age of 12, for four years I coached him. And I watched him uh, come along in his hockey. At Amsterdam the last year, who he plays for, he's played centre forward. So he kicks lots of goals in club hockey. However, what he is, he's a very powerful runner with good skills. But when he plays centre forward, he runs too far all the time. He makes huge, big leads. He, can't make subtle, subtle leads. So they lose a little bit up in the up around the edge of the circle. So I think that's one thing they'll have to look at. The other thing with their defenders, they have a young boy called Wouter Yoli playing as a defender. And Wouter Yoli is not the best passer in the world, but he plays in a position in Holland where historically they've played one of their smartest players and their best passes. So he plays generally the sweep. Whenever they are at four and they keep a sweeper, that's wow to Joe Lee. And I'm not sure he's a good enough passer to be playing in that position in this team. The person who would be the best in that position is the kid at left defender, Sandra DeWine. And he can play a midfielder as well if, if you really wanted to. But if he played a uh, sweeper, um, with uh, uh, their captain Vanderhorst, that would make a lot of difference to. So structurally, looking at the World Cup, I'm not surprised that uh, that we beat Holland, Australia beat Holland. They should have. Um, I think we're a two or three goal better team, uh, and they've got some a little bit of work to do to fix up. So with their defenders, uh, if I was playing against them, I would have let uh, people like Balkastein have the ball, people like Yali have the ball, uh, and make them. Uh, bring the ball out and uh, you'll know you'll get a lot of intercepts off them. So, uh, the person whose name I was trying to think of before, the other midfielder, is uh, his name is Sander Bart. So if you put Backer back, so you, now you've got Backer, Sander Bart, Vega and Kemperman, 
and you got yourself a seriously world-class midfield, of which they didn't have in the in the World Cup. So the Germans, so their style, they're trying to play the same way uh, as they did at the Olympics, but there was one difference. Back at the Olympics, when the Germans had the ball in in these areas, uh, and their front players were wherever, it doesn't matter, sometimes they were in, sometimes they were out, but if these midfielders recognised to go, they went. So they had first of playing, um, uh, Viteas, although he played sometimes at the front, uh, Hauke as the centre midfielder there. At this tournament, they were very stodgy in the middle of the hockey field. Try, um, I don't know whether that was deliberate, or whether they didn't have a lot of time together, or whether they, because they were worried that they didn't have Furster, but they just weren't as attacking at certain moments as what I'd seen them a couple of years before. Uh, their, their structures and what they were trying to do uh, were, were very good, and they played one very bad game. So their structure, uh, again, was... Uh, uh, most of the top teams are actually quite similar in, the, in a lot of ways, in that they uh, mostly have uh, uh, four players, but then they'll go from a four to a three, either by, um, always do that, Jim, either by send, keeping one of the back players and sending the other one in. Sometimes when they send the other one in, they keep the centre midfield and the one who's just gone in, so they split like that. So Australia does that quite often. The, Germans, the Dutch do it sometimes, the Germans do it sometimes. Germans and Dutch, though, it's more common for them to go, that's the, the sweeper who's gone in, and the centre midfielder goes high. And then the centre forward goes high. Now, that centre midfielder is Hauke at the World Cup. At the Olympics, they did that quite often. In this tournament, they didn't do that as much. So my gut feel is that they just missed Furster who played in the left midfield position during the Olympics. Now he's their best midfielder, centre midfielder, but in the Olympics they played him as a left midfield with Hauke there, who's a very, very good young player by the way. But at this tournament uh, that they played, they, it was like they were a bit conservative, uh, like they used to be, going back a while ago. They just didn't attack as, as, as much. And, but Hauke can do that, and so can their other midfielders. So I was a, bit, a little bit surprised at that. And they paid for it in the Argentina game. Uh, they, they lost to Argentina, with, uh, and which was uh, all the top teams, apart from Australia, who played Argentina, had close games, and Australia destroyed them. Uh, I think they understood how Argentina was playing a little bit better, and by this stage were able to pay some respect to them, whereas I, I think at the start of the tournament, uh, uh, you shouldn't say this, and it's maybe completely off track, but it was almost like the, when the Dutch first played them, uh, that was a struggle of a game. Uh, early, I think it was the second game the Dutch played, and they really struggled against Argentina. And then the next game, they had to play Germany. And it was uh, interesting for, for me to, to see them end up getting beaten. And it looked like at any stage they could have just taken the game pieces at certain moments, the Germans. But they didn't. Um, so, uh, reasons, don't know. Structure, s same uh, numerical structure on a hockey field, but they just didn't quite attack at moments that I thought they would. By the time they got to near the, I think virtually their last game, where they played New Zealand, and they, did, they were five, five one up against New Zealand, they just destroyed them, and New Zealand's a good hockey team. Uh, and then New Zealand got a couple of goals back right on the death, I think a couple of corners, and ended up 5-3 or something, but really, if the Germans had played like that in their first four games, three games, then I think they might have got or given some teams a little bit of a problem because of their recognition of how um, how sweepers play in the modern hockey. With the when teams are sitting with a three, I'll, I'll do this. The teams going this way now. When teams are like that, going that way with a back three, and the opposition's got the ball. So let's say the opposition's got the ball around this area. Where this sweeper plays varies a lot with the teams. And so I have made a, not an art form, but I do look a lot at the sweeper because a lot of teams are picking 
this guy is someone who could easily play a midfielder. Uh, you know, like they play Nolsey a lot there in Australia. Um, Harner and Furster take it in turns to play there for Germany. Uh, Wilder Joe Lee playing there for Holland out of the best team. They're basically the best teams. And they all play it slightly, slightly differently. Depending how that player plays, I think, looking at how the Germans have historically played, and probably us too, Australia by the way, are very good at recognising how that guy plays. Is he back there a little bit? Is he in the middle? Or when the opposition midfield has the ball there, is the next player they run into the sweeper? Is he really high? Now, if you go back to the Olympic finals, when, if you have a look on the tapes, whenever Nolsey was right up here, the Germans just bypassed them and just went straight there or there and then brought the ball inside. So they didn't do that almost at all at this. That's the Germans. The Germans yeah. didn't do that at all at this World Cup. Yeah, sorry. But the Germans this time didn't seem to me to take um, enough opportunity to uh, uh, exploit the way that other teams play. It took them, to me it looked like it took them three, three games to get the feel of it. Now why that was, I don't know whether they just got together beforehand or whether they um, uh, had to change some players, but you know, it doesn't matter, what you, it's only what you see. So that's what I saw with Germany. Uh, same system, very organised, uh, just weren't quite as good in the midfield going as previous. For me. The other team that was interesting for me uh, was Argentina because before the tournament I'm not sure many people would have picked Argentina to finish in the four. But Argentina, they they were really they were really useful. Again, they uh, played a four to start off with, and they had a three, and they would have a three, and this centre forward sometimes played back, sometimes played, but I'll just draw it like that for the moment. So that's basically what they did. They did the same as other teams in attack of sometimes running an outside player up. But what they mostly did when they kept their three was put one of the defenders, one of the one of these four, so let's say the centre one, would so very similar to the Germans. So they keep the three, he would go in there, the midfielder went to there, and the centre forward went really high. And what they did when they did this is they were very opportunistic and and I'd love to see the stats, uh, so some of the teams and who are, if anyone who's watching this was there and you have all the stats, I'd, I'd really like to know uh, how many corners they earned compared to how many goal shots they were getting because they were getting a lot of corners just, you know, uh, anecdotally, just watching the games, I didn't sit there the first time I ever sat there and not taken a whole lot of notes, so uh, which I enjoyed. But they earned a lot of corners, and more importantly, they scored from them. The young kids out of their Junior World Cup team didn't do as well with the corners in, in the Junior World Cup earlier this year, uh, but certainly at the World Cup, he was uh, with a lot of confidence and, uh, and, flick, and flicking really well. And but you could tell that the Argentinians were playing for them a lot as well. So they weren't trying to break and, and uh, set up three players. They were quite happy to break with just two players and then just rely on using their skills and earn a corner, keeping the, the other guys back. The other thing, that, so, so they changed their structure quite well. They had clever players all over the hockey field. They uh, played with a lot of... Uh, it's a motherhood statement. They played with a lot of Latin flash, uh, flair and passion. But they also changed their shape. So at the moment the opposition were in a four, they went, oh, sorry, a three at the back, they went one, two, three, four, dropped the player back, sent it forward, so now that he's in there. So they got their normal. So now they've got a four and they went to a two. Every time someone ran, so they were never outnumbered in this part of the hockey field. And then they, for, to break again, uh, they just relied on, on these guys getting breaks and earning corners. And they did it well. They did it very well. Completely different to what we've uh, seen most of the teams that do. Uh, uh, but it worked for them. And to finally, I think, 
Uh, when teams are doing things different that catch other teams out early, the smart teams decide to zero in on them and pick them out, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure that Australia had spent a lot of time having a look at them because they just, in the, in the semi, they just destroyed them. How did they destroy them? Uh, by understanding that and trying to play, uh, what they did was um, the moment you have two, uh, I've got to draw this, so the moment you have two like that and you've got an extra player, what they did, the Australians got an extra player up here, but then they did switches all the time. So, just, so in the end, what they did in these areas was not use power or strength or whatever, they tricked them. Because the Argentinians, you could tell, were so uh, intent, these defenders in here, of just keeping their play. So they just got shifted a little bit, someone had run into a little space, and off they'd go. And then they got penalty corners again, and uh, just, just too good. The second thing they were better at, uh, Australia, in these tight areas, is the tempo and uh, that Australia plays. Uh, and this is a, a, a bit of an athletic thing, I think. But, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, that's to denigrate. Uh, they were very good, Australia, at playing a tempo where they could still do their skills better than the other teams. And a team like Argentina, in the end, just couldn't cope. So the continual, continual, continual ball movement, pressure play, the, the Argentina had previously been good at getting the ball out, but they got dispossessed a few times, and then Australia just ran at them again. So they did a couple of things Australia. One was that the players they got into these areas then just doing little shifts all the time. Like you could never tell with Australia whether who, who was the right midfielder or who was the left midfielder all the time, because it was different players, but they were just in different positions as well. And I just think in the end, it was just became too much for the Argentinians, I'm afraid. Uh, but they'll learn from that too. Uh, Australia did that well, I thought. So getting back to Argentina, so Argentina, I thought, were quite clever uh, at shifting their shape according to what the opposition were doing for a team that I hadn't seen do that before. Uh, I would, I would uh, after having done some, um, run some coaching courses over there once upon a time, in another era of my life, uh, for FIH, um, they're very heavily influenced in shapes uh, by soccer. And the Argentinians love coming up with all sorts of uh, different systems to play. But this time, they, it was like they just kept it to a couple and went in and out of, out of that. Um, and then plus, clever players at the front, earning corners, and a very good corner. It was a very good corner. Uh, generally speaking, went to the same side a bit too much. And I, and I would guess, again, just putting on my old ex-coaches hats, that they would have watched that a lot, the Australians, for the semi. Because I don't, I'm, from memory, I don't think he scored. Might have scored one, but I think the, but if it was, would only been one. Um, so that's my overall impressions of the main teams. Um, the, uh, also the key players uh, in those teams and how I would play against them. Uh, anything else you want to What stood out generally out of the, out of the World Cup? Okay, um, all right. The one that stood out first to me was um, Australia, actually, uh, as I was, we were talking earlier, that their ability to play at a high tempo and still control the ball was better than other teams. Anyone who tried to play at that tempo then started making mistakes, whereas Australia didn't make as many mistakes. So that's, that stood out. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but that was a clear difference in the teams. Uh, were they better at that now at the World Cup than they were in London? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that because uh, they were pretty good at it at, at London, that part, that side of the game. Uh, no, I think that the, I think that side of it was pretty similar. Um, uh, there were slight positional changes with some of the Australian guys, and they brought back Hammond, who makes a difference. Uh, so clearly, when you've got Hammond Knowles at the back and uh, the young, when you could play the young anywhere, you know, like you could play him as one of the, like he plays there for Queensland, he's a gun, so um, you've got him as a, uh, the luxury of playing him as a midfielder, 
uh, knowing that he's got uh, guys like uh, you know Hammond uh, back here, which we didn't have back at the Olympics, so maybe that made a difference as well. Uh, so I thought the I, yeah I thought the endeavour and work rate and skill was pretty much the same. What do you expect the Dutch, the Germans, the Argies to do differently for Rio? Okay, yeah, Rio. that's a good question. Uh, well, look, Maxi Caldas is now the Dutch coach, so God knows what Max thinks, uh, but I know what I'd do. Uh, I would, uh, as I said earlier, uh, they need to strengthen their, their midfield with uh, players that are more used to being able to play with a, uh, uh, to run and or pass, to recognise the two. And they're, they're, they're a player short in their midfield to do that. So I get Backer straight in there. So then you've got Backer, Vega, uh, uh, Bart, Kemperman. And uh, the guy that plays uh, mainly their centre midfield at the moment is a guy called uh, Vermeul. I wouldn't expect to see him stay in the group, but he's a steady player. But he's not going to win you an Olympic final. Or, uh, he, he's just not. Um, and I've discussed this with the Dutch, so if they end up seeing this, I don't mind. Uh, but the Mullen, I, I wouldn't. But those other guys, they, they, are, they, they are seriously good players. Um, they have to do a little bit of work on Kemperman because sometimes he goes out of a game. He's a little bit uh, precious on occasions. And if you have a look at the World Cup, oh, you, you maybe don't see it on TV, but uh, Simon Orchard played quite close to him on a number of occasions, and uh, Kemperman didn't like it. And... Uh, uh, a friend of mine was the ground announcer who was privy to the feedback from the umpires talking. He could hear everything that the umpires were hearing because he needed to to know when to, he could say anything out on the ground announcing. He said within 10 minutes of that final starting, Kemperman started whinging to the umpires about Orchard within 10 minutes of the game. And Orchard wasn't doing anything, he was just paying close attention. So, so the Dutch have got to sort that out a little bit. They have to sort out who their left defenders is and who their sweeper is. And if they don't do that, they'll have the same results in big games. Because you know, Lee can be exposed and so can Balkenstein. Um, uh, me seeing some of the, there's a couple of kids out of their under 21s who are quite good. Um, and there's a couple of players who aren't in the team who are also quite good who could play this defensive position the left-sided defender uh, because they're very good at getting up the ground. If you're going to play like all the other teams, the top teams at the moment, you've got to be able to go right and left and they are seriously exposed whenever the Balkenstein's on the field. Um, it's, and I mean seriously exposed. As a defender, great. And he makes every game he'll make one or two diving, saving, miraculous looking tackles because he's in such a bad position. <laughs> And, and everyone goes, oh, wow, gee, isn't he a good defender? Well, really, if someone said to me uh, uh, about, for example, oh, so I use an Australian, who I think is the best defender ever in Australia, is Liam De Young, even though he doesn't play there, is uh, that you would look at him and say, gee, he doesn't get in trouble much, doesn't do much, because he's so smart he doesn't have to. <laughs> he's always in the right position, always carries the ball in the right way, always has his body in the right angle, can carry the ball forward. And you know, Lee and Balkestein can't do that. So Dutch have got a few things to do with that. Um, their forwards, I don't think, are a problem. And their midfielders, I don't think, is a problem. But I think their defence sure, sure is. You, uh, and I think um, I, I used to have the odd discussion with uh, Max when I was there. Uh, he was a player then. He wasn't coaching. Uh, but I, he's, not, he's not silly. I think he would recognise some of that. He certainly with the girls, he's coached the girls for a few years, the Dutch girls, and he certainly has their defenders uh, attacking. He had people in good spots. And he was very keen on their their midfielders uh, to run, like Ellen Hoag. Uh, when they do all the tests, and I know this, and when they do all the tests on the, all the male and female squads, she's the fifth fastest runner in the, all the Dutch squads. The fifth fastest, men and women. Like she's seriously quick, so when she decides to bowl, she goes. Um, and she alternates between playing at the front and the middle with Max, so uh, will he do the same with some of the men? I suspect he might, because Backer is 
fast and powerful. Uh, he'd be much better in the midfield for them. Germany, well, I'm not sure where Germany's going to go, uh, but they've got a little bit of work to do. Uh, Furster will clearly make a difference, but the biggest difference for them was not having, and I've got to try and remember the names, uh, Timo Wies wasn't there, who was at the, who was at the um, Olympics. Uh, Witthaus, he wasn't there, and he came back for the Olympics. Uh, Zeller, who two years ago was playing fantastic, and this tournament was really poor. So whether he's got to the point of being uh, injured or whether he uh, is just the uh, intermittent study that he's been doing and not training as much with his, because uh, he's studying for law degrees, whether that had anything to do with it because he didn't play as well um, or he could have been injured, uh, I don't know. But not having those play, uh, and then and then not having um, not having Furster as well, uh, who's a seriously, as we all know, a seriously good hockey player. So you take those players out of a team, and they play different. Interestingly, that will be the same for Australia over the next two years to see which ones come in for place of uh, if um, if Liam, uh, Robbie Hammond, um, uh, Turner. Uh, if, if Jamie doesn't get picked anymore, so you take all of a sudden you've just taken four seriously smart hockey players out of our team. So um, that that affects teams. So, um, but going back to Germany, so for Germany, they got a little bit to do with deciding with their midfielders. Uh, I think uh, they going that way, they didn't quite, as I said earlier, they didn't quite attack as much this time, so they've got to find out people that can play there. Uh, I, I don't know, out of Hana and Muller, I don't know how whether Muller's going to keep going, but uh, but they are still, those two players as a pairing of centre defenders uh, were good, their wing defenders were good, uh, Fouche and the, the other front players, they were okay, it was more that they didn't seem to uh, have the same punch in the middle of the hockey field, so they've got to sort that out. Now, Furster solves the problem, he comes back, and he only missed because he was uh, he did his knee, Furster. Uh, and the other one they've got to sort out, because he's a good corner taker as well, is Zeller. Uh, if he's going to play like he did this time, because he just looked a bit big and lumbery, so I think he's got a bit of work to do. Uh, and Argentina, well Argentina is a pretty, I don't think they're going to lose anyone. They're a pretty young team. Uh, the Belgians are the ones that have got a little bit of work to do. Uh, I think uh, most people, me included, thought they might sneak to fourth at this Olympics and they got destroyed in the round match by Australia. Uh, uh, they just uh, did not cope with that continual pressure, pressure, pressure and ended up making some mistakes. Uh, but they've got a lot of talented young players, Belgium, and they played back in uh, when they, I think they drew with Australia and then lost, and Australia lost on penalties. But they even keep with Australia, even though we had different players, I know. But they were technically and tactically, they played okay, Belgium. I think it was a bit of a shock to them as well here. So I think there's still some, some room for them to improve. You know, they might take over Argentina's spot over the next two years, maybe, I don't know. Um, so uh, I think Australia, not that we're, talking about Australia, judges got to sort out with who's the next cab off the rank with their players they're going to miss. Germany are in that process, they've just gone to a World Cup doing that. Um, they have to, the Germans, the funny thing with the Germans, they historically have always just played well enough to either draw or win their first couple of games in a tournament and be better at the end than the start, which is what you want to happen, you want to be able to improve. Uh, this time they were just, they just had one hiccup in one game, so here's me saying, oh yeah, I think there's things that they've got to get better at, but by the end of the tournament they were still playing very good hockey, even with our first day and Zeller. Uh, now, why that was, I don't know. Uh, it could be because they you know, hadn't had as much time together, or you know, who knows, or whether, or whether it was just those players uh, learning to play with our first day, because that, first it was, uh, was in the team and training with them, and it was just at the last minute that he did his knee. It wasn't as if he, they knew he was out, you know, a year ago. Uh, that happened late. 